welcome back to the 2016 Exhibit Columbus Symposium, Foundations and Futures, which is presented by the College of Architecture and Planning at Ball State University. And um, next up, we're going to do something uh, new and interesting. We're going to have uh, three of the 10 2016 J. Irwin and Xenia S. Miller Prize competition finalists take the stage and sort of respond to that brilliant set of talks that we just heard. Um, and just as a note, this session is presented by Indiana University. I know that a lot of IU faculty, staff, and students are here today, and I'd like to welcome them. I also believe the Dean of the School of Art and Design, Peg uh, Feynman, may be here. I know I saw her last night. Thank you, Indiana University, for your generous support of this project. So in this session, we are going to uh, meet some new friends of Columbus. I'm really excited about this. We're going to meet uh, Benjamin Aranda of Aranda Lash, Erwig Baumgartner, and Scott Uriu of Baumgartner Uriu, and Yugon Kim of IKD. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend and my colleague, uh, Kelly Wilson. Kelly is the director of the Indiana University Center for Art and Design in Columbus. Before coming to Columbus five years ago and starting a design revolution here in town, he previously held academic positions at Columbia and Harvard Graduate School of Design. And as the principal of 922, he is a practicing architect as well as a painter whose works are exhibited frequently. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Richard. And hello, Columbus. I'd like to introduce to you our guest this morning. As Richard explained, uh, we've asked uh, the Columbus, uh, here in Columbus, for our Miller Prize finalists to comment on what we heard today in our presentations, as we'll do for each of our sessions. So I'd like you to recognize Benjamin Aranda of Aranda Lash. Uh, next to him is Yugon Kim of IKD. And there is Mr. Erwig Brumgarder and Scott Uriu that are sitting to their, his left of B plus U architecture. I'm going to, uh, we're asking these people, these gentlemen, to comment on the things they heard today. They've also visited Columbus all day yesterday. Uh, we ran them around through the paces. We took them to the sites they'll, they'll be thinking about designs for. And we showed them um, on a bus tour the architecture of Columbus and filled their ear with as much as we could about the nature of this community. This is the opportunity for them to learn who we are as a community and also for us to learn who they are, which is why the exhibition in the IU Center for Art and Design opened last night to exhibit the work they do as a practice so that our community could look at the work on the walls and get some measure of how they think, what they do, and how they make. So we're excited to have them here and each of these sessions of presentations will be followed by various members of the Miller finalists to help us uh, engage this conversation. Thank you. So we just heard a, a remarkable set of talks that discussed uh, various attitudes of designers, where they seek their inspirations, their precedent, how invention works, whether form follows life or life follows form. We looked at the remarkable nature of a, what I would call a, a blended or weaved practice in the work of uh, Girard, uh, who took many sources of inspiration for his work and seemed to have blended multiple practices, both in art, in design, interiors, exteriors. It didn't matter whether he was looking at the inside of a building or the outside of an urban street, as in Washington. Before me are three firms that all participate in design in a similar way. They have two also blended practices. So I'd like to first ask Benjamin uh, how he thinks about his blended practice, because they're known for their furniture, their art, their sculpture, their architecture, even forms of urbanism. And did they, did you see any uh, correlation between what you saw in Gerard, how you think of your practice, and also Columbus? Um, you know, I, well, uh, the presentations uh, this morning were, were amazing, and um, first of all, let me say it's such an honor to be here uh, and to be selected. Um, I, I do feel somewhat ignorant for uh, having never uh, visited Columbus before, um, so apologies in advance, but it has been an absolutely inspiring uh, couple of days, and, and you know, I was 
in the Girard um, uh, lecture specifically, I was, um, you know, I think we're also struck about uh, when we see his use of colors. And, and I, was, I was asking myself, like, what, what is it about these colors that might relate to, uh, to Columbus as a, um, as a cultural uh, um, breeding ground for amazing uh, works of design and architecture. And I think it had, uh, it really had to do, in my mind, with the way he creates uh, real intensities. I mean, the, the colors are very saturated. And when you look at the use of, say, red, um, like a, a saturated deep red, he'll put it next to like a magenta, like a, a complementary color. And that makes, that makes that field of color very intense. And, and he'll do that with, say, a blue next to a purple. And so you get this kind of intensification of the, of the color field. And, you know, I think maybe, like, one way to answer your question is, I think Columbus is, is really like a, uh, like a moment of intensity. Uh, in, in the design landscape uh, in this country. And, you know, you don't, you don't really see that. I mean, I, I work in New York. We have a practice in New York and in Tucson. And one of the reasons we, we like to have, uh, let's say, a foot in, in both worlds, one very urban, which is intense in its own way. But what you see here in Columbus is, is, it, is, is really like an intensification of culture and, and design because it's really set into relief against this, you know, really beautiful landscape. Um, but also, uh, you, you get this idea of like a, a you know, real intense uh, support, patronage um, of, of culture. And, and I, I honestly, um, I mean, I called my office after this tour yesterday, and I was, I just said, look, we all have to, all of you have to come to Columbus. I can't believe we, we've never done this before. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, uh, an intensification. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Yugon, I'll ask you, uh, uh, I have to admit something here, uh, folks, that Yugon, I knew Yugon as a student uh, back in the days of GSD, and he was one of the more uh, interesting students because he came out of a, a sculpture background from Bard College, and so he had a completely different take on how to be an architect than the students he was surrounded by. And, uh, I want to ask you in this way that Gerard seemed to take his inspirations from so many places uh, that I wondered how you think about your own practice relative to uh, the influences you felt from artistic inquiry and with your work as a designer. Uh, well, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity to be involved in this and, you know, I only started my practice about four years ago, so it was the first time I was able to reflect uh, and look back at the kind of breadth of experience uh, that I've uh, gained over time. And so, as uh, Kelly mentioned, I uh, was a sculptor, and I never had an intent to ever become an architect. Uh, and uh, probably because my, my father's an architect, and there was kind of rebellious side against me. <laughs> um, but, you know, what I was really interested uh, on this tour in, of Gerard's work was uh, I saw this work of different scales, you know, working on very small scale textiles to kind of large scale kind of streetscapes. And it made me think about my own kind of work where I also look at those different various scales and I kind of zoom in and out that looking at the detail um, and I look at uh, kind of large scale ideas. Um, I think the, the way that I use my breadth of experience to inform my practice is that I kind of uh, wear different hats to try and enter into a project in different ways. So it's still very difficult for me to kind of uh, separate my kind of, I don't know where that line from kind of sculpture, from furniture to architecture lies, but I know that sometimes when I put my architecture hat that I, I learned from the GSD, if that's not a way in, um, I, I, I trust my kind of intuition that I, I gain through sculpture and then I go through there. Or um, I, I worked for a long time a furniture shop and um, I became very interested in craftsmanship and then 
sometimes if those other two between sculpture and architecture doesn't want to start thinking about the making or fabrication as a way in to understand a problem. And that's how we kind of build our practice now. Thank you. Uh, interesting. So uh, I would switch to you two. I don't know which one to ask first, the question or how you guys want to answer this. But I will tell you that one of the things that's unique about their practice at B plus U is that, um, uh, I believe it's early, you have a background in musical composition by way of Vienna. Uh, and that this informs a great deal of how you guys uh, comport, compose, consider, invent, and so forth. And that's a particular form of blending uh, that one hears of but doesn't see executed a lot and would presumably be something new for here in Columbus. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we, we actually started out, um, th there was always a crossroads, at least in both of our careers, a little bit about uh, dealing with composition and uh, in particular electronic music. Um, and we use that as a trope, if you want, to kind of like launch into our office uh, and what we're gonna do. Uh, also just looking at, uh, not necessarily at architectural precedents, but probably more precedents in art and music. And that's uh, kind of where our office still, um, I would say, takes the inspiration from. Uh, we look a lot at, um, uh, of, at the contemporary art, obviously, and a lot of music trying to figure out what are some uh, similarities and what are some uh, noble kind of uh, things that we can take from that and kind of uh, we have then taken those things and really developed our own kind of like series of objects uh, if, you, if you will like uh, and that became some sort of a language over the, over the time but it's uh, with music in particular, we started out very early on trying to <clears throat> write code and software to translate quite directly things from, from sound into, into form, and then that became, uh, at some point, um, then uh, less about the actual formal translation, but then more about the conceptual under, underpinnings of those things. And there is similarities, uh, I would argue, at least uh, on a formal level, between those two uh, professions. Of course, when it comes into the kind of uh, matter of, of things, it becomes very uh, different, different, two different pairs of shoes, but like it was hugely influential for us at the beginning. Yeah, I'm gonna echo the, the same sentiments as uh, Ben and Yugan, that, that we're really very happy and pleased to, to be invited here as well, though, too. Um, you know, on the, on the, you know, and echoing uh, what Herbig's saying about uh, our blended practice, I mean, that's uh, irrefutable as, as far as uh, multiple interests in, in all sorts of uh, different, aspects. Um, but what's interesting to me about Gerard um, was uh, the fact that he was also such a uh, collaborator um, and or influential on so many other um, people. I mean, it's obvious uh, Charles and Ray Eames were, were absolutely influenced by uh, Gerard. Um, and to work with uh, Saarinen, uh, the younger Saarinen, on uh, such a stark, you know, ultra, you know, uber um, uh, aesthetic of, a, of the Miller residence, which is, you know, this nine-part grid um, in these rather, what I would say, incredibly funky objects um, uh, thrown in there is really a, a, a really uh, interesting and wonderful contrast of the, of the two. So, you know, to be able to, to work together um, in that nature, I think, is also um, a certain degree, you know, part of part of our practice. I mean, we have a lot of colleagues as well that we also work and collaborate with, and and uh, are able to blend our practice that way as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this kind of raises the question: is uh, in, in describing a bit of uh, your blended practices, the role that uh, uh, what we call precedent, or the role of things that have come before us, play in how your imagination works? We learn from. Eva, Lisa, and from Alexandra, the, the, the sort of evolution of a one school schoolroom multiplied right by Wies at Schmidt, but then uh, evolving further as notions of education uh, push us to find other forms for buildings uh, or for the way in which that the, um, uh, the, the precedent in buildings tropes, Eva, Lisa, Lisa uh, described it, were reinterpreted and kind of uh, reimagine and push forward. So I'd like to ask if you, how, how you all have thought of that particular role, the role in which things that have come before you uh, play towards the, how your imagination kind of works. And I'll, I'll return back to you, Ben, if you, if you might. 
you know, the, the, the idea of history um, as something that only exists in the past or that we're only looking backwards is, um, is not really a contemporary um, like way of understanding it, I think. I mean, I think all of us, uh, and definitely in our practice, we really see history as a, as a generative force, as something very dynamic, almost like a, um, like a material that you can work with. Um, so that, you know, we, we, we actually really like to use uh, historical objects uh, or moments in history and I mean, even like this image, for instance, of a, of a building in, in Miami that uh, we completed last year, the idea was to work with Miami's architectural past, which is Art Deco, and find a way to uh, introduce Art Deco into this century, but with, uh, with a different idea of basically rhythm and orchestration. Art Deco happens to be a really good way to render the sunlight in Miami. Uh, a lot of the folds and the kind of creases and concrete. And so this was our way of using a, a kind of moment in history as something that we could, that we could relive, like reinterpret, um, but also like in a way like really understand history as something like generative, something that's always going to be alive. So I, I um, would ask this question that the, uh, the uh, you've only been in Columbus for a short time and it might be uh, premature to ask you if you can sort of already see some thing you think uh, one could lay off of uh, in the sense that in the same way that uh, the reference to the barn was used for the Schmidt School uh, or even if you visit uh, First Baptist, it certainly is uh, barn-like. Uh, in its form, it's in, particularly its interior uh, feeling. So it's a kind of transformation. I don't know if you found any things that sort of piqued your interest that way. Well, I should say, first of all, that, like, you know, we never uh, try and, like, jump the gun on design ideas. Like, it's really this um, delicate, you know, animal that might run away scared if yes. you over... Yes. You know. um, <laughs> So, uh, but, but I think... Yeah, don't spook the animal. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, no, but I will say, um, you know, one of the things that's... Uh, our, our side is, the, is in the Millrace uh, uh, Park uh, area, um, which incidentally, uh, my first job as, as a young architect uh, when I came out of school was uh, with Stanley Seidowitz uh, in 1995. And uh, three years before, he had finished the, um, uh, the structures in, in Millrace Park. And I remember as a student, when he was my professor, him showing us this, this project that he was building and really just being, you know, like totally blown away. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of in my DNA. So I know so much about those, those structures, the elevator, uh, the arbor, um, but I had actually never seen them. So this is a kind of, you know, uh, like a big, um, I guess that's a 20 year loop uh, for me. Yes. Um, but I will say maybe what's, what's inspiring, you know, I'm often, like we, we live in an age of, of information and we live in an age where things that um, aren't physical uh, have a huge effect on our lives. Um, and basically this, this town floods, um, biblically, like a few times, a few times a year. And, you know, we're walking around the site yesterday and, and people are telling me, yeah, the, the water line, you know, during 2008 covered the lampposts, which are... Sort of Old Testament, yes. Yeah, which are, which are, you know, 12 feet tall. And so I guess... What blows me away is, is kind of what I can't see or even necessarily fathom. Um, and I was thinking about it too, actually in relation to, uh, sorry to take so much air time, but, but in, the, um, in, in looking at uh, the Miller House um, and its connection to, uh, to classical um, uh, pavilions, houses, uh, Palladio and Nice, um, is, you know, the, the other, big technique uh, that Mies used and that's in uh, Palladian's house is 
is the use of the podium as a way to construct a view of the landscape so that you have like a, you have a, uh, you have a short distance and you have a long distance view. And what the podium does is it cuts out the middle distance so that you're able to get these kind of picture windows with the landscape. And it struck me when I was in the Miller house yesterday, you have that podium, but it's the landscape and it's the landscape uh, acting in defense of these floods. So somehow there's this translation between, yes. uh, between the kind of classical podium uh, and, and this uh, flood mitigation device here in Columbus. Thank you. Scott, Scott and Eric, if I could ask you a, a similar question. Now, the, the, the role that, uh, how you looked at uh, the role of precedent in your own work, and this in case, uh, when um, Benjamin mentions there are also unseen forces that uh, have great influence in our lives, not just the ones that are historical, uh, it seems like your work tends to respond to that as well. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, that has been a big influence. I, I want to say maybe something that's related to that, although not uh, directly first, is like that I, I find the role of education and design uh, here an amazing uh, kind of um, marriage, you know, in, in terms of like that this, I think it's super important, and Scott and I have been talking about this recently uh, from a political point of view, but also in terms of like a design point of view, um, uh, to engage uh, young students very early on in their, their career into, uh, into design and make them or show them some of the values or like break down some of the barriers, you know. And so I find that um, incredibly noble as a, as a thing. I just wanted to say that because I think it's, uh, it's super important and it's something we often overlook and uh, especially looking at our schools uh, and the status of what what design plays in, in, in most schools, at least in Los Angeles, is not very high on the agenda. You know? So I think it's very important that to bring this in very early. Now to your question about like uh, working with invisible forces, I would say, <clears throat> or things that we don't see. Um, we, uh, I would say, um, to kind of um, develop some sort of a, a, a logic uh, uh, in, a, in an approach, for example, object to ground relationship, which was just brought up, uh, we often find ourselves working with uh, a series of, um, of things we either invent or things that are there or things we imagine that are there. And uh, uh, lately, more often than not, we're actually creating our own scenarios in terms of like trying to uh, to produce some sort of an environment that we then work heavily in computation with to kind of like transform this into some sort of a reality. So there's, I'm not so sure, and then I'm not so sure it's that important either that you can exactly trace where it came from, uh, but often it's rooted in some sort of a logic that has to do with sight, it has to do with objects, it has to do with uh, uh, a sort of history of objects that we collected over time that we are, uh, working with a sort of trope. What, what kind of objects from, do you guys collect? Um, all kinds of uh, crazy things from, um, from found pieces that we're interested in. So we have this whole collection in the office of, of uh, people who call it junk, but like for us it's... And you, it's and, you, <laughs> and you put that up on a shelf and you look at yeah, it from time Yeah, it's to like time. it's, you know, things that are found pieces. Sometimes we make things, or sometimes we then modify those pieces that we found, so they are kind of uh, estrangements of real things, and I think that's very um, became kind of very important to our work to kind of like look at things that are real and figure out what makes them kind of um, strange or different. Like how little do you have to change actually to kind of remove them from their context and use them in a different way. So that kind of idea of estrangement has been very yeah and sort of. Yeah. Familiar. Scott, you, uh, is that how you work with? Yeah, them? absolutely. Part? I mean, it's a, it's sort of a, the the combination of familiar and strange is is sort of one of our our big premises in our, our practice. So, absolutely working with context and working with exactly you know on on additions or, or whatnot, the actual um, building that is is there, um, and it gives us a lot more to to. It makes our job easier, to be quite frank. Um, you know, the better the the original context is. Um, and so there's much more to respond to. Um, um, and so that's a very, very important uh, part of our, our job. Yeah, 
Unseen forces, I mean, I might argue, um, you know, half this hillside uh, house that we're, we're building um, uh, is driven by a crazy building department uh, forces that uh, have absolutely, quote unquote, helped or not, uh, helped shape exactly what, what that building looks like. Um, uh, it is uh, tied into the original context, tied into the original hill, and a crazy and slightly bizarre um, uh, hillside ordinance uh, codes um, that are absolutely driving the, the, these uh, quote unquote design decisions uh, irrefutably. And uh, you know, we have, a, we have a set that has 20 pages of uh, building department diagrams that are explaining this thing to the building department that have nothing to do with the construction of the, uh, of the building itself, but they are purely diagrams so that um, building officials can absolutely sign off on, okay, this is, this is a porch, this is a balcony, this is, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, as far as counting square footage, heights, et cetera, et cetera, so. I, I'll turn to you, Yugan, and ask you, uh, uh, as you design and invent uh, in the way that uh, some of these discussions this morning describe the influence of other pieces of work and how they uh, helped move concepts forward, or how agendas with uh, changes in program like our schools uh, forced or gave possibility to invention. How do you approach that in your own practice? What sources are you aware of that you're using that are references to things you've known and other forces which are more abstract? I mean, it's difficult for me to quantify or uh, characterize the exact uh, kind of elements that lead to a design. For, for me, it's always been very intuitive. Um, and I, I always let things kind of marinate over time. And I, I mean, this... That's a great word, marinate. Yeah. I mean, this, this, this visit alone, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because there's, there's just so much to uh, consider and think about. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking a little bit about this kind of how history and unseen forces uh, influence design as well when we were talking about just a moment ago. And I have a very strange relationship with architectural history or uh, because uh, I'm not the best, I'm not the most studious kind of person, but I always think about history in terms of memory. And so memory is what um, really I kind of uh, draw from, these kind of powerful emotions. Um, so in a lot of our work, we think about these uh, uh, the memory of gravity or the mem these kind of strong primal uh, emotions. And it's something that I learned from you know, working for uh, Renzo Piano, is that uh, he always, he thinks about these kind of basic primal kind of uh, emotions and feelings as a way to inform the design. And it gives so much long lasting uh, impression and impact to the final design. So in, thank you, in the, um, uh, when uh, Ron discussed the role of the honey locust in our landscape out here. And that given the landscape that now you're starting to see and some uh, uh, hear about, uh, do you have any, what did, I would like to ask how you think of the things that you make that, that sit in contexts that are not urban or, or are urban, but they're set into a larger context, which is our Midwestern grid and our topiary, what grows, the fauna and flora, et cetera. Uh, how you have sought out relationships with landscape in your own works in the past and what, what you might see here? Well, I mean, I have to say, I'm always jealous of the tree, you know? I want to be the tree. <laughs> I want to be the tree. <laughs> I want to be the tree. I mean, what either slide was showing was the, was the missing grid and the, and the tree. And what fascinates us about that power between those two very differences, I think that's a very <clears throat> charged territory. And for us, we're always trying to engage that, actually, except that we're trying to build the tree. You know, not literally, but like we're trying to get to that to that spot where we produce enough provocation between the context and what it is we're producing, enough friction. And that doesn't mean it's not contextual, but it's like it starts producing an emotional friction. And I think that's super important for architecture. So did that resonate you with you when you saw the con juxtaposition that Ron was dis demonstrating very beautifully between yeah. those locust trees and their irregularity? And here's this absolutely uh, marching regular order that comes right. out of Mies and industrial stuff, et cetera. That, did you, does that, uh, does that resonate with you as a kind of yeah. juxtaposition that you seek, I mean, with your own work, oh, yeah. 
uh, you might imagine landscape not being, you would almost seek regularity. Yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, uh, our, our own work, it, it absolutely is enhanced by, um, by the landscape that, that we, are, are, um, we work with, uh, landscape uh, designers that, that, that have, ha have worked with us throughout the years. And in, in fact, you know, the, the sort of addition that was on uh, the screen a second ago, and then likewise this uh, new house that we were, we're working on, the second story actually has an interior courtyard that's lifted off the ground on the, on the entire second story, that the second floor is absolutely um, centered around this uh, artificial, uh, this, this courtyard, a uh, landscape courtyard. That's not necessarily artificial. It's a, uh, it's a real courtyard. But the issue was uh, the, the client wanted a private garden where basically, basically she could use the, the master bathroom uh, in and not have to worry about anybody else being around, etc. That too, and so it's a it's a it's but an it's probably answer. landscape is probably more integrated in our stuff. Yes, okay. So we, we call that place the jungle. Scott's just talking about, and uh, we have lots of jungles. You know, uh, you know just jungle is a, is like just short for like a super lush, uh, exuberant green environment, and that the architecture plays off from. So it's less about contrast. So it's like we are actually using landscape in a way to um, uh, reinforce what the architecture is trying to do or is, is doing. So it's, it's kind of a, um, a supercharger, right, that we are adding to it in a way. You got, your practice has, um, you've tri you, tri you um, champion wood yeah. as a material that you're very fond of and you've actually, the, what you might not know about Ugon is that in, um, uh, it's a requirement of architects to uh, provide safety uh, encode to fire, and that we do this by providing materials that are fire resistant for so many hours to permit the escape of a building in the event of such. We're asked to use extra layers of sheetrock or CMU, concrete masonry units, because they resist uh, fire. Uh, what Yugon achieved was the, if I've got this correct, that you actually uh, got approved, did you not, the wood block as a substitute for CMU in fire resistance uh, in the construction of building? Well, I mean, we're, we're Could working... Could you describe that a touch? Well, I mean, uh, I've worked with wood for a long time, and actually that uh, has been the constant through uh, when I did sculpture to furniture to architecture. Um, I, I actually didn't work with uh, wood uh, at the beginning of my... when I was working with architecture, but more recently, uh, very much so. so um, I have a great affinity to timber, and, um, and so we designed this, well, this is an exhibition that we curated at the National Building Museum, and so this is about, the, uh, there's a new kind of renaissance of uh, timber construction uh, that I believe will happen in our cities. It's about uh, uh, building uh, you know, large-scale buildings with timber, and uh, I think uh, that it's an interesting relationship with nature now, so that um, you know, trees that basically grow for free by the power of the sun, um, they can, uh, you know, help uh, provide, uh, there, there's many reasons to do so for ecological reasons, but also for uh, elevating kind of rural manufacturing jobs uh, here in the United States. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll scroll through another slide. There's, um, during that research of kind of, uh, for this curation, I, I realized that uh, um, there's some significant waste through kind of the processing of wood. And so the, there's this, um, about 30% of a log uh, is, goes to waste and is downcycled. And so we developed, uh, we tried to capture that, to capture the carbon that is uh, kind of sequestered in those kind of members and then uh, kind of upcycle it to create this uh, timber module. And so timber, usually it comes in kind of linear form and planar form, but not yet uh, kind of a modular block. So we've been working uh, with uh, a, a number of different kind of institutions to test it structurally, test it from a fire rating standpoint, and also test it, um, um, uh, you know, from weathering. And so we've been applying a lot of kind of different types of finishes. And so um, it's kind of an uh, exciting time for our, our practice to kind of work at this uh, building scale, uh, I mean building module scale, building material scale to kind of develop new uh, kind of designs. So wood is an intrinsic part of your practice and how you think about its integration to design. It uh, ben, how, how do you, would you describe your practice relative to the issue of landscape? Oh, well, 
You know, we have a, um, a rather uh, contentious uh, relationship with, um, with, with the idea of nature, that it's somehow... Um, Wait, you don't like it? With the idea that it's, uh, that it's, that it's separate from ah. us, or that it's somehow... I mean, I would say to... I found uh, Ron's presentation uh, really inspiring, and, you know, one thing about Hilbesheimer and, and Mies uh, and their relationship to, uh, to trees is that um, trees were also uh, a, 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 an, an active model for them of, of structure and of urbanism. So the idea of, uh, of branching um, as, let's say, an operation that, you know, if you were to abstract a tree into one generative operation, you, would, you could say branching. Like if I, if I know the rule branch, I could maybe build a tree in a, in a, in a computational sense. I, Mies and uh, Hilbersheimer, you know, actually used like branching structures to, to develop hierarchies of, of transportation, of infrastructure, and of laying out cities. And, uh, you know, there's, there's this wonderful es essay by Christopher Alexander that was very, um, uh, that was very really critical of this idea of using uh, uh, a, a model like branching to describe a city. And the essay is called, you know, the, the, a city is not a tree. And it's, and it's a real, I think it's, um, it's, it's a warning sign for architects and for designers to be careful about overly reductive models on something as complex as life and, and cities. Yeah, you have a, there's a beautiful sculpture you guys have. The black, um, what's it called, black line, is it called, I think? The morning line. The morning line, yeah, yes. That's, it's a wonderful arboreal, almost. Uh, it's yes. resonant of a number of visual metaphors we could use, but certainly nature enters that conversation really quickly. And the tessellation, the sort of triangulation, the way in which you deal with parts, the whole, resemble much the way we often think about. Uh, natural growth. Wouldn't you say that's a yeah? That's interesting. Well, so that project, uh, an artist asked us to. Uh, they asked us to like make a model of the universe. Small order, yes. And you know, and and uh, and our our response was, you know, what model? And he said the cyclical model. This is Matthew Ritchie, who's who's really interested in in uh, an art practice that, uh, that draws cosmology. And so, in cosmology and narratives, and, um, and our, our response was like, well, we can, we can do this, but just with, uh, uh, provisionally, we can do it just with one shape. And, and that, that idea of doing something with just one individual unit and learning how that instance can grow and accommodate all kinds of um, complexities was, was our response to his, uh, to his idea. So, so the piece was basically a very large, kind of building-sized, uh, three-dimensional fractal. But it wasn't, um, to answer your question, like it wasn't, it wasn't based on anything uh, natural. Right. If anything, it was, uh, it was the reverse. It was, you know, we were really looking for uh, new constructions of what of what, of what nature could be. Yes, so I, the, thank you. The last question I've got, uh, briefly, as we will uh, wind this down with this last question, is that uh, Marlene Newman talked about two different processes by which uh, the, a, a, a sort of tradition of modernism uh, sort of went almost, in, there are at least two definitions we can give it. And I was struck by the f food metaphor of uh, the one described by coming out of Lursat through Siren and Alta was more, it was like, Modern design is, in their hands, is like tofu. It, it, do, it by itself doesn't taste like, you have to dip it in the sauce of something there before it, you know. So I, what, what's cool about this is that, since we're foundations, is how our processes work when we invent and how we think. In part, to tease some of this out is how to figure out, how to hear how the act of invention and the creative mental processes we use to conjure things is produced. So in the 
short amount of time left, I'm going to ask for a very, a, 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 if you can, a sort of, if you could summarize how you guys work in invention or how you think of a, an aspect of your invention that would help illuminate uh, the concept of design for this crowd. Well, I, I think there's maybe two ingredients <laughs> to that. Uh, one has to do with, seconds. yeah, <laughs> one was already brought up was, I think we marinate a lot too. Marinate. You know, I think marinate uh, is a very yeah, good We're close process. to lunch, so it's... Um, <laughs> it's key <clears throat> because often, and then the second one is, I would say, uh, just being able to dive straight into it and not being afraid of making any mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And, and with any uh, uh, decent uh, Asian cook, you can make tofu uh, <laughs> uh, taste like almost anything uh, that you need it to. You. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of it is also, you know, with a, with a business partnership, I, you know, love it because it's a, it's a vetting process though, too. You have to uh, stand up any idea that you you are doing uh, to a uh, six foot seven Austrian uh, intellect uh, uh, at any day, and uh, it's it's a it's a process. If it's going to withstand a certain amount of vetting, it's probably a good idea. You gone your creative process. Well, you said it was intuitive. It's intuitive, but I mean, I think um, it's really to take further on the cooking metaphor. Um, it's just trying to put as many different ingredients and put them in different orders and different ways and different quantities. And so I, I would say that's the best way I can apply is that the breadth of my experience is basically different ingredients that I, uh, sometimes it's layered, sometimes it's uh, sauteed or whatever. And so it, it comes together and hopefully... Uh, it, it makes a meal. Yeah. Right. Ben, can you carry this food metaphor any further? Yeah, I, it's just so, uh, I actually, uh, it's almost a contradiction when I'm thinking because uh, when, when I teach, I tell my students, you know, to, to quote Charles Kettering, you know, uh, a problem well put is a problem half solved. Uh, I always tell them like, look, be very deliberate, uh, make recipes for your process, like be very uh, uh, clear in the steps that you follow and we'll repeat them and we'll, you know, build rigor. So that's a cooking metaphor. But then my wife actually always complains that I never follow recipes. You know, and I, and it's, and it, it is like my, you know, my cooking is, uh, you know, it's, things are burning, it's a mess. Uh, sometimes it works out, but, uh, but I, you know, I, so I don't know. I mean, it, uh, I think cooking is cooking, architecture is architecture. Thank you, Benjamin, Ugon, Erwig, and Scott. Thank you, people.